Well, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Alan McLean is Emeritus Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at uh, University College London. And um, his title for tonight is uh, intriguing, I'm sure. 250 years ago, Man Midwifery, Manuscripts and Murder, Maybe. So please welcome Ellen. Thank you very much, Terence. And uh, good evening and welcome. Can you hear me or is it? I've got ringing in my ears. But So 250 years ago, Man Midwifery, Manuscripts, and murder maybe. And this is a project that I started 12 years ago, following a publication in a journal that I was editor in, where there was an allegation about murders, historical murders. And several years after that, when Professor Doyle and I were doing our diploma in the history of medicine for the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries in London, I resurrected some of this material. but. Otherwise, it's been a long gestation before its delivery tonight. I want to acknowledge that today is Anzac Day. 109 years ago, my grandfather, who was with the artillery, but University of Otago sent 573 students and staff, not just to Gallipoli, but also to the Western Front, and they contributed some in medicine, in mining, where they obviously understood tunneling in various endeavors. Sadly, approximately one fifth did not return. They died overseas, including three medical school volunteers who survived the war, but then died in the 1919 flu pandemic. So this is the first page of a publication 250 years ago, that is 1774. If you can read Latin, then you can use the top half of the title page. Otherwise, the second half is in English. The anatomy of the human gravid, that is heavy or loaded, the human gravid uterus, illustrated in figures. And these were 34 plates of 13 subjects between three and nine months gestation, showing various aspects of the uterus, the uterine content, and in particular, defining what was at that time new science that there was a separate fetoplacental circulation, quite separate from the materno decidual circulation. This book was written by William Hunter, man midwife, and you'll see he described himself as physician extraordinary to the queen, who was Charlotte, wife of George III. And if that's not enough, he has a dedication to the king. And this dedication, um, sir, this work has no other claim to be the honor with which it is distinguished by your majesty, then it illustrates one part of science hitherto imperfectly understood and finishes off your worships, uh, your majesty's most faithful subject and most dutiful servant, William Hunter. Now, William Hunter was born and educated in Lanarkshire, that is almost halfway between Edinburgh to the east and Glasgow to the west. He was well down the pecking order in his family, although brother John Hunter was 10 years even younger than he was. But he was brought up in a family where there was always anxiety, was there enough money to go around and was it going to allow them to be educated? William was sent off to University of Glasgow at the age of 14, where he was going to study for the church. But he had some difficulty with some of the church's principles at that time. And after five years, he left with neither a degree 
nor a profession. He wandered around trying various things, including teaching, and eventually he made contact with William Cullen. Now, Cullen was a friend of the family. William Cullen would be the title for another lecture in the history of medicine. He was among the first to teach medicine using the English language. And he was professor of medicine in Glasgow and then later professor of medicine and chemistry in Edinburgh. And so Cullen arranged for Hunter to go to Edinburgh to learn anatomy with Alexander Monroe Primus, and then to go to his friend William Smiley in London to learn midwifery. He also gave a letter of introduction to James Douglas, who was, it is described, an outstanding Scottish physician, man, midwife, comparative anatomist, fellow of the Royal Society. And it just so happened that when Hunter arrived in London, he found there was a vacancy going with Douglas. And he was offered a job principally to tutor his son, but also to help look after some fairly important patients. And there you'll see his associations with royalty and the family of royalty. But things didn't all go well. And... Hunter's father died and he was caught in the dilemma, did he go home and help sort out what was happening to his mother? And then worse still, his tutor died. But he stayed on in the family. He became increasingly involved in looking after these very special patients. He continued to tutor the son, William, and became engaged to Martha Jane, who was the daughter Again, sadly, another death, Martha Jane died of tuberculosis soon after they were engaged. Hunter kept his promise to his mentor and took young William Douglas to Paris. You had to be careful because there was war going on between England and France at that time, but managed to get there and to attend a series of lectures before coming back to London. Hunter was impressed with the teaching techniques that he saw in Paris, and in particular, in particular, the allocation that each student would have their own cadaver and could systematically work their way through the human body to understand the anatomy and to try and understand something of its function. He also was busy in getting himself appointed to various hospitals, improving his CV. He uh, was awarded a doctorate in medicine, University of Glasgow. He asked his young brother, John Hunter, to come to London to help him as an assistant in the anatomy department, principally to procure bodies for dissection. And then when their mother died, their, their sister Dorothea came and they moved out of the Douglas household and moved to Covent Garden where they set up home and their facilities. Now this portrait is by Alan Ramsey. It was done when Hunter was 42 years of age. You can see he's finely dressed and he's described as a small, perhaps frail man with a pleasant manner which of course helped him to establish his obstetric practice among the upper classes and also a substantial income. This income, this income meant that he no longer had to worry about his finances, that he could think, research and collect. And so his anatomy school started to collect bodies female bodies and pregnant female bodies. His publication would include 13 of them with the first arriving in 1750. This is the second subject. It is the model for plates 11 and 12, and it's a woman who died of flooding. She had what we call an inevitable hemorrhage. That is the placenta or afterbirth instead of coming after the birth, is situated over the cervix. 
And so that in the days without blood transfusion and uh, or without cross-match blood and transfusion and access to abdominal delivery by cesarean section, it was inevitable this woman would die from a hemorrhage of what we call placenta previa. This plate, also at that time, um, again, in significant detail, we have very little understanding of why these mothers ended up uh, on the dissection table. Uh, and certainly looking at her, there's no suggestion that this was placenta previa, an unknown cause of death. These plates are from Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci, in the last 25 years of his life, spent a significant amount of his time studying human anatomy. And in this particular page in my book on da Vinci, it demonstrates studies of the fetus. And in the lower part of this page, you'll see the relationship of the fetus within the uterus, relationship with the membranes, here done in red chalk and brown ink. Now, these are one of 750 anatomical diagrams held in the library in Windsor Castle. That in Hunter's time, they were available in Kensington Palace. And I speculate that Hunter, through his royal and court connections, would visit the palace and its library and get to know and study and even attempt to emulate these drawings. So this is plate 32 in Hunter's book. This is the 13th subject at three months gestation, showing the fetus in utero and then still attached by its navel string or what we call umbilical cord. So this, I think, shows that Hunter had access to da Vinci's paintings and was able to follow some of these. Now, the second man midwife I'm going to tell you about is William Smiley, also from Lanarkshire, a man who was educated and then practiced there and went to London initially to learn something about obstetric skills, was disappointed with what he found there, and then attended the Gregoires, father and son, in Paris. And while there, saw the use of a machine or a phantom. And I'll come back to that. Uh, when he returned to London, he realized that there were others practicing in London who really knew nothing about the advances they were making in French and indeed European midwifery. And so he set up teaching courses and eventually ran 200 taught courses at a total of 900 plus pupils, including some pupil midwives. They were in separate classes, the men in the morning, the women were there in the afternoon, rather small numbers of midwives would come. And he delivered a small private practice, nothing like the big practice that William Hunter had, but had a large following among the poor people of London because they had difficulty in getting access to any help otherwise. He obtained his MD, Glasgow, and then he went on to start to write his own manuscripts. This is the first page of one of the biographies done about Smiley. It's done by Professor Robert Johnson, professor in Edinburgh, and it shows a portrait of William Smiley done by himself at the age of 22. So that Smiley not only had skills in medicine, but it was also artistic. And that will become important later on when we have a look to see what he was drawing. This is him much later on. He was then in his 60s. This portrait was done by Rembrandt. This is a working man midwife, not with the finery that William Hunter had exhibited in his portrait. An advert, uh, an advert for 
a course of lectures upon midwifery, and you'll see towards the bottom the manner of delivering women in all the variety of natural difficulty and preternatural labors performed on different machines. So that he had human pelvic bones in a basket work um, outfit covered with leather on the abdominal and uh, uh, pelvic surfaces as an imitation of how to deliver pregnant, pregnant women. And this is his treatise, The Theory and Practice of Midwifery, first published in 1751. This is my copy, which is a much later version, edited by McClintock in Edinburgh. The first volume is very much about the theory of the practice as Smiley saw it. And in the next two volumes, two and three, description of the cases, 531 cases, and his description of sometimes successful management and sometimes less successful outcomes. And then this book, a set of anatomical tables of the practice of midwifery. And here there are 39 plates demonstrating different aspects of obstetrics. And this is an example painted by Jan van Remsdijk. This is an oblique lie with a prolapsed arm, either from an unstable lie. And 140 years before cesarean section became a safe option for the mother, this was a desperate situation. This baby would produce obstructed labor, the uterus would rupture, and that would be fatal for the mother, unless there was intervention in the man midwife would be able to perform internal pedalic version and sometime, somehow to be able to extract this baby by breech extraction. What were these two men doing in what was essentially women's work? For millennia, childbirthing was women's work. What were the factors that led and encouraged men to become involved in this? And the first is that Pope Sixtus gave consent that executed criminals could be dissected legitimately within universities. And so there was an increasing academic interest in human anatomy. And people such as Vesalius in Padua was able to dissect in public and then to, dem and then to publish. Uh, because publication had become, an, had become possible using woodcut blocks to demonstrate what he was seeing. Secondly, a publication in German was translated by Thomas Reynold called The Birth of Mankind, and it was essentially about childbirthing. We know that certainly in London, the majority of midwives were unable to read. And therefore, this book was of little value to them. But increasingly, doctors, and they were all men, became interested in the secrets that were revealed, and therefore, an increasing medicalization of childbirth. Charles II and the Restoration. Charles II, it is said, was a philanderer that no woman between the ages of 15 and 55 in the court at that time was safe from his advances. The large numbers of subsequent pregnancies led to an increase in the use of man midwives in an attempt to reduce or confine gossip. We know that there were subsequent monarchs who had significant obstetric problems. If you saw the film, the favorite with Olivia Coleman, you'll know that she had 18 pregnancies. Only one successful child surviving, but then dying before Queen Anne, as she was, got to the throne. So that some of these monarchs had significant obstetric challenges, and therefore there was more medical input into them. And then the recognition that there was a role to save the mother. It would take much longer before there was any attempt to save the child, but to save the mother, the mother meant that 
manual intervention was required for almost anything other than a natural presentation. Bloodletting and bloodletting meant 10 ounces of blood, 300 mils of blood was performed during pregnancy to try and reduce edema or the swelling. And it was thought to help prevent the child drowning at the time of delivery. The Chamberlain family had introduced secret instruments that were used to help facilitate deliveries. And a series of other instruments were used, championed by others, so that the levers, the vectors, the hooks, the fillets, the crotchets, the perforating scissors, and so on, all became part of the man midwife's armamentarium. And of course, growing up in some of these cities where the sun didn't shine, there was a very real risk that you would get rickets and that would distort the pelvis. And therefore you had to be somewhat masculine to be able to pull a baby out through a narrow pelvis. This is the first page of the birth of mankind in the Medical Academy in New York. And here you'll see some demonstrations of fetal lie. You'll see in some cases the fetus is standing or squatting or here even kneeling. Quite unlike what we know is the real situation and is demonstrated by Hunter and Smiley in their books. I was editor of the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology over a series of years when I was working in London. And I was invited to become interested in an article entitled Man Midwifery History. I wrote an editorial saying about the lessons that we had to learn from history. This article challenged the acclamation that we gave William Smiley and William Hunter and suggested that these two had scurriously killed their pregnant patients to obtain bodies for dissection to demonstrate or illustrate their manuscripts. Now, of course, grave robbing and obtaining bodies for dissection was common practice, not just in London, throughout the UK at that time. James IV in Scotland enabled the Edinburgh barber surgeons to obtain criminal, criminals for dissection. Henry VIII gave similar allowance, but there was always a challenge getting more and more bodies. And we know that sometimes bodies were snatched if the family weren't watchful following death. And those days quite difficult to define a systole. You put a, a glass close to the nose to see if there was any frosting. And if there was nothing, depending on the humidity or the conditions at the time, that was death. And you're perhaps likely to wake up a few hours later unconscious and wondering where you were. So that it was common practice to snatch bodies and to rob graves. And we know from uh, accumulation of data that 592 bodies were dissected in anatomy schools in London uh, just after that time. So that's a lot of bodies that were required. We know that uh, the Edinburgh surgeons were warned that they must not supplement their income by being paid for raiding graves. Um, but one of, the, one of the academics, Professor Munro, who was professor of anatomy, uh, on one occasion had to seek sanctuary within the university. Uh, a rather unfortunate, unmarried, undelivered pregnant woman had been executed to teach her and maybe others a lesson in the grass market of old Edinburgh for the crime of concealing her pregnancy. As the grieving family attempted to carry her body home, they were ambushed by medical students seeking bodies for dissection. And then John Hunter, we know that John Hunter was employed by William to obtain bodies, but also the rather 
bizarre story of the Irish giant, a young man in his early 20s who was almost eight feet tall and undoubtedly had acromegaly. And he was followed around the circuses in England by curious people, but also by anatomists. And when he got to the stage where he was losing his vision because of increased uh, intracranial pressure, he made it clear that he did not want to be buried in case he was resurrected, but wanted to be tossed into the sea, preferably the Irish Sea. But John Hunter paid the undertakers 500 pounds, a lot of money in those days, so that a weighted coffin would be thrown into the Irish Sea. And he kept the body in secret for the next four years. For a long time, it was exhibited in the entrance hall, the Royal College of Surgeons in London. There's been a bit of embarrassment about this, and I think the body or the skeleton is now hidden out of sight. This is a mort safe in Greyfriars Cemetery in Edinburgh to stop robbing of graves. And when Mary and I were in Linda's Farm or Holy Island on the northeastern coast of England several years ago, in Belford, I found this watch house. So there was a house built within the cemetery and there would be watchmen paid by the family to watch. Once a body was in the grave for more than several days, it was barely worth dissecting. It was those first couple of days. And so people, men, would be employed to keep watch, to keep the body safe. Of course, you will know the story of Burke and Hare, that an old lodger had died owing money and so Birkin here took him down to Knox, who was the anatomist, and were offered uh, good money. And so decided there was some money to be, to be made in this. And so from the places off the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, they collect, collected another 15 very fresh, recently smothered cadavers. And it was only when the last one, Mary Doherty, was found under the bed uh, that they were caught out. Here turned King's evidence. Burke was tried, hanged, and dissected in public and witnessed by uh, Walter, Sir Walter Scott, the novelist. And those of you who read Walter Scott's novels may know in Guy Mannering, this is published 1815. So this is 12 years before Burke and Hare. Two lawyers arguing. Forgive me, Mr. Playdell, there's only one case upon record, Terence and Waldy. They were, you remember, resurrection women who had promised to procure a child's body for some young surgeons. Being upon honor to their employers rather than disappoint the evening lecture of the students, they stole a live child, murdered it, and sold the body for three shillings and sixpence. And so the accusations made by Don Shelton in his article were that in the absence of apparently healthy women dying undelivered, because this was not recorded in any of the textbooks at the time, and they not mentioned in the pages of Smiley's treatise that there was obviously skullduggery. The concept of murder was not addressed by Smiley's two biographers, and I'll mention that briefly. He talked about forensic quality, forensic meaning related to courts of law. And when I spoke to Don Shelton about this, he said that the 18th century pictures that were drawn of these murdered women was equivalent to the modern day forensic or mortuary photography that was used in bringing a conviction. I don't think Smiley um, and his demonstrations, I don't think that uh, Don Shelton really understood enough obstetrics to really to be able to interpret these things. 
we know that um let me just find we know that there was no formal documentation mortal maternal mortality at that time um we estimate that there were probably about 10 maternal deaths per 1,000 live births. Seems a lot, but that's similar to what happens today in sub-Saharan Africa and places like South Sudan, Chad, and Nigeria. So not mentioned in the books because the data wasn't there. And also remember in the absence of pregnancy tests, and ultrasound that the diagnosis of pregnancy was often uncertain and you certainly couldn't rely on a menstrual history. Among the poor of London living close to starvation, oligomenorrhea was not uncommon. So that if your menstrual period was missing or irregular, then pregnancy was probably not the first thing you thought of. And only when you experience quickening sometime after 20 weeks, that is fetal movements, that you realize, oh my goodness, I am pregnant. We know that in Smiley's book, there are documented deaths from hyperemesis, that is the excessive vomiting associated with early pregnancy, from flooding or abortion, usually spontaneously, but sometimes induced with all those complications from extra uterine or ectopic pregnancy, and then co coincidental deaths, such as due to smallpox, tuberculosis, starvation, and alcoholic, chronic alcohol ingestion. And then many recorded deaths of underdelivered women. We, we no longer use the term underdelivered, but we divide deaths into antepartum, intrapartum, and postpartum deaths. So that intrapartum, there were women who died of flooding, antepartum hemorrhage, of convulsions, which is eclampsia. Up to 2% of labors would become obstructed and non-progressing. And when that occurred, the, the uterus would continue to contract until it would either exhaust and stop contracting or until it ruptured. And with ruptured, there would be internal intraperitoneal bleeding, and the woman would die. So that these deaths are recorded, and extraordinary that Shelton couldn't actually interpret these. In one particular case described, uh, described by Smiley when he was in practice in, in Scotland, case 442, a woman who was known to be rickety that is, she had rickets as a child. During a strong contraction during a labor, something in her belly tore. The child could only be delivered by opening and decompressing the skull and then extracting it by a crotchet. And I've got a, an example to show you. Then when delivering the placenta, he found that the intestines were pushed down so that during this pain, she had ruptured her uterus and intra-abdominal, intraperitoneal contents had been prolapsed down through the vagina. Now, Smiley and Hunter both use Jan van Remsdijk, a Dutch artist who was in London at the time, and Camper refers in his diary that not all van Remsdijk's drawings were from real life. The children were placed in pelvises and women. The children themselves looked natural, but the other parts were copied from other preparations to demonstrate abnormality in the presentation, the lie, or the position. The smiley Van Remsdijk did his drawings in red chalk, large enough to be used in teaching sessions, whereas his drawings for Hunter were smaller and in much finer detail. Professor Camper was also from the Netherlands where he was professor of medicine and then later became professor of anatomy and surgery in Amsterdam. 
He'd been to two of Smiley's courses earlier on and he came back to learn more, particularly some of the practical sessions and also to make some drawings on the use of forceps and the mechanisms of labor working with Smiley. So I'm going to show you a series briefly of photos from these manuscripts to see if you can detect evidence of murder. This is plate one from Smiley's set of tables. This is an anterior view of a normal female gynecoid pelvis, normal pelvic inlet, normal pelvic outlet. Plate two is similar, but lateral view. These skeletons were readily available. You don't need to murder pregnant woman for these. This, on the other hand, is a rickety pelvis. You can see how the sacrum projects anteriorly, dramatically reducing the pelvic inlet, and that the subcubic arch is severely distorted and narrowed. Again, relatively common in Glasgow and London. This is an example of cephalopelvic disproportion. Again, you'll see the pelvic inlet, the pubic symphysis, significantly distorted, the inlet quite inadequate to enable vaginal delivery. And this fetus has become obstructed. You can see irreducible molding with the overlapping of the parietal bones. The details of mother and fetus are minimal. What we do see is that the uterine wall in this obstructed labor has become very, very thin to the point of rupture. This is plate four from Smiley's book. This is designated the external parts of generation. The subject is undoubtedly dead. You can tell this from the laxity of her anal sphincter. We don't know why she died, but she's clearly never been pregnant because the hymen is unbroken. This is similar but quite different. This subject is very much alive. Her uterus is contracting and expelling. The mother has closed her glottis and she is pushing to deliver her baby. And I would speculate that Van Ramsdyke came to several deliveries to observe this and then went home and made this drawing, not from what he'd seen in the anatomy room. Two examples of early pregnancies, the first one where the uterus hasn't even risen out of the pelvis, and I suspect that both these were from women who died of other causes without knowing that they were pregnant. Twin pregnancy. Without ultrasound or x-ray, you would only recognize a twin pregnancy when having delivered the leading twin, you put your hand back in to discern what was happening to the placenta and found that there was another occupant within the uterus, the following twin. This would occur about one in 80 pregnancies. So you would need to murder a significant number of pregnant women to find a suitable twin pregnancy for dissection. This is what we would call a transverse lie with cord prolapse. Again, believing that Van Riemsdyk had drawn this in a contrived situation to show what was happening and that Smiley had written in his treatise, the techniques where you avoiding handling of the cord that you would be able to manipulate the fetus internal pedalic version and breech extraction to achieve delivery. This is a breech presentation. This is probably the same pelvis, but the fetus rotated through 180 degrees to show sacrum anterior, sacrum posterior. Again, we believe that breech presentation would occur around 3% of all presentations in labor. So that again, without ultrasound, you would have to be a very skilled clinician to be able to recognize this before the onset of labor. This is one of Camper's illustrations demonstrating shoulder presentation, obstructed labor. This baby can't come out this way unless it's manipulated. And then in this, 
a situation where having become obstructed, you have to disarticulate body and skull. And here the skull is being removed separately using the crotchet, one of the instruments available for that procedure. Smiley was very keen on developing different forceps. This is Van Remsag illustration of applying forceps to the after coming head with a breech delivery. And Camper is showing here in an illustration with minimal maternal or fetal details, but you'll see there are two forceps, one very obvious, and then a second one dotted in here with a pelvic curve. And the growing realization that different forceps, depending on descent and position, different forceps used for different clinical situations. This is a plate from Hunter's book. Some of the red chalk that has illustrated this has rubbed off, but this is what the engraver can do. So that given these diagrams, engraving for copper plate and illustration, able to make this a remarkable piece of dissection and illustration, but without any hint of murder. This is the original subject here in the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. If Hunter had been involved in murder, then it would have been very difficult to keep it quiet from his, his practice. And you'll see here that there were, uh, where I am, there were a significant number of patients who came to see him in association with royalty and their families. There are a series of prime ministers, wives and families, members of the, um, the landed gentry, hoots from the banking family, the Hollands of Holland Park, and even Miss Ray, who was the mistress of the Earl of Sandwich, all counted among the patients who attended him, all making him respected and a very rich man. With his riches, he continued to collect 650 manuscripts, 10,000 printed books, 30,000 coins, and 15,000 anatomical and natural history specimens. His legacy was to transfer all these to the purpose-built Ontarian Museum in Glasgow. What was Smiley's legacy? Well, sadly, the lessons of intervention weren't always learned. And this is an example of inactivity. I called it the Royal Obstetric Tragedy. Uh, the story that might have, might have changed the succession of the monarchy, there would have been no Queen Victoria. Princess Charlotte was the daughter and only legitimate offspring of the prince who was to become King George IV. During her labor, she was managed by two man midwives, Croft and Bailey, who were brothers-in-law. And Bailey was the nephew of William Hunter. When she reached second stage, neither of them were confident about applying forceps and facilitating delivery. If only Smiley had been around, she and her son would have survived. And Princess Victoria, daughter of another of George the Fourth's brother, would probably never have been of her, would never have been heard of. It was an obstetric disaster, with the baby being stillborn. The princess mother dying not long after delivery and in anguish to Richard Croft shooting himself some months later. Finally, here is a list of some of the other publications that Don Shelton has produced, challenging some of the concepts of dissection and how these bodies were obtained, if you want further reading. And so Here's my story, these two man midwives, William Smiley, William Hunter, and their manuscripts, 
and the major contributions of their medical artists, their engravers, and their printers. Did they murder to get the material for their dissection? I don't believe so. Smiley describes considerable deaths from different causes among the women he was trying to help. And I believe him to be an honest man. William Hunter, I'm not so sure. Van Remsdijk walked out on him in disgust when unlike Smiley, Hunter omitted to acknowledge the artistic skill of Van Remsdijk with his manuscript. Furthermore, it is suggested that it was the scientific mind of younger brother John Hunter who considered first that the fetoplacental and utero decidual circulations were separate and independent. This was never acknowledged in William Hunter's manuscript, and the two brothers fought and later went their separate ways. I've probably said enough. Thank you. Thank you. Now, questions? Wayne. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alan. That was amazing. I, it's interesting how you conclu your conclusion at the end, one was a murder and one not. But could I, is it possible that neither were? Um, I mean, you showed uh, some um, um, art, uh, art of, of, uh, of the forceps deliveries, for example, which clearly must have been interpretations of uh, the actual delivery. So they weren't, uh, they weren't from uh, dissections, were they? they? They were just from interpretation. Or contrived. Yeah, yeah, contrived, yeah. So is it possible some of those other um, so-called dissections were not dissections, they were also contrived? Uh, like, for example, the one um, of the twin pregnancy um that you suggested might the woman might have been murdered uh, I, I suspect she probably died of some complication either a hemorrhage or an eclamptic seizure yeah. or frequently seen with multiple pregnancy and it would be a complication like that that would lead her away rather than murder and and the art art came from a dissection rather than an interpretation of how do you know it was from a dissection though how do you know that how do you know that particular, that was from a dissection rather than an interpretation or contrived? Knowing that murder was practiced, that there were occasions, and I talked about Burke and Hare, but there were also murderers in London who obtained uh, bodies for dissection. Um, you can't deny that it never happened. I think it would be extremely difficult, though, to select which of your pregnant patients would hold the interesting clinical challenges that it was worth leading them off and murdering them, I think. I don't know. I don't know. But Just following on from that, the, the first um, illustration you showed of um, the William Hunter uh, gravid uterus um, and you made the comment quite rightly that uh, the woman probably died from hemorrhage with placenta previa. Yes. I've, ne I've seen that drawing before, but I've never noticed the fact that there is a placenta previa there. So do you think that, that was the actual woman that he was describing? In other words, in the text, is he describing placenta previa, which is, you know, the placenta sitting over the cervix leading to the... You follow what I mean? The, um, what I'm asking is, was that drawing from the actual woman who died because he's demonstrated the abnormally placed placenta as the cause of death? I wonder. I think what happened, William Hunter was perhaps rather slow in developing the idea that he was going to produce a manuscript with a series of illustrations, but he was collecting bodies in his anatomy room and there were a couple of pregnancies he probably had some clinical information and i suspect that he probably uh, understood that there had been hemorrhage flooding but that was in 1750 
and he only published in 1774, 24 years later. And I think over those years, he had a growing knowledge about some of the complications. And when he perhaps saw other cases of placenta previa, he went back into the anatomy room and said, my goodness, this is a major previa that covers the os. There's no way out for this baby. Death is inevitable. I suspect that it was sometime later that the, the uh, diagnosis dawned on him. Yes. Other questions? I've got one other, another question related to that. Um, you mentioned that um, William Hunter was a student in Edinburgh of Alexander Munro Primus. Um, and um, later on, several years later, William Hunter, when he was in London, had a very acrimonious uh, relationship with Alexander Munro Secundus, the son. Mm -hmm. And it was all over uh, the precedence who had discovered first the lymphatic drainage of the testis, as it was. Have you got any information about the relationship between William Hunter and Alexander Primus, uh, Alexander Monroe Secundus, who must have been young men at the same, uh, about the same age? Uh, yes, when, so when they were both in Edinburgh, they were both working on the lymphatic system. Uh, and William Hunter, when he published his work, didn't acknowledge or he claimed precedence over Monroe Secundus. Anyway, I've just, have you got any insight into their relationship when they were presumably students together in Edinburgh? There are various, for instance, John Hunter was not a good publisher of his scientific findings. Uh, there are some people who publish avidly and and widely, and others who have ideas and sit on them a long time. And I think probably both Hunter and Monroe Secundus had made these observations, maybe had corresponded, mm. and then had decided, okay, I'm going to beat you to publish this. And in those days, there weren't many medical journals that you could yes. publish them. It was usually published in book form rather than a medical journal. Yeah. Uh, and so there would be rivalry. And several people commented that William Hunter often carried grudges. He never really forgave John Hunter. John Hunter left the anatomy school and went and worked as a surgeon in the Navy uh, and came back and worked quite independently of William Hunter. And there was a great falling out, even though the two of them uh, they had a sister, Dorothea, that they both cared for. Um, and I think probably Hunter was, he went to London to stay with Smiley, but when he ended up with James Douglas, Douglas of the pouch of Douglas, he realized that not only did Douglas have a daughter, but he also had some fairly wealthy patients. And so he changed allegiance. And I think Hunter probably did that more than a few times during his life. If he could get some advantage out of it, then he fought for those advantages. Yes. It, there is something that Chris has brought up. Um, did the obstetric textbooks of the 1950s contain dead infants in the photographs? I have some and have always wondered as the fetus looks very lifelike. Um, so I'm thinking back to when I was medical school here in Dunedin and the textbooks we had, Ian Donald was, Practical Obstetric Problems was the textbook that we used. And although Ian Donald wrote uh, in lengthy descriptions about managing some of these things, I can't remember a lot of photographic record of what's going on. Uh, so I'm not sure which authors. Um, again, when we look in the 1950s, the 1950s we were looking at safer cesarean section. We were looking at availability of antibiotics since World War II, safer anesthesia, so that obstetrics was becoming better, but it certainly wasn't perfect. 
and there would be some women who would still die because of complications such as eclampsia, uh, late antipartum, antenatal eclampsia, where people would die uh, and there could be dissections and photographs. I'm not sure that really answers the questions, but I'm, I'm not sure which textbooks and uh, I couldn't really comment any further. Um, if I were a judge, I wouldn't recommend to the jury any punishment for murder for these guys. Okay. Um, <laughs> certainly they both died of natural causes. I don't think there were any angry husbands or enforcers of the law that uh, tracked them down. Um, and it was really Don Shelton. Don Shelton was a chief finance officer in various finance and commercial uh, corporates, mainly around Auckland. He was probably a very good accountant and knew his statistics. I'm not sure how much medicine and obstetrics that he really understood, but we had some good arguments about this. And he obviously had some publications, uh, not only about the, he's, he wrote quite a lot about Tobias Smollett, who was, medically qualified, but then became a novelist and went off to sea again as a naval ship surgeon. Uh, and you have to remember at this time, 1746 was the Battle of Culloden, and it was quite difficult if you were a Scotsman. You either supported the Hanoverians or you supported the last of the Stuart dynasty, the young pretender, Bonnie Prince Charlie. So that there were all these sort of things going on, living in London, uh, would have some risks associated with it, certainly if you went round in a kilt. Um, so that if I were a judge, um, okay. What? Is that enough? So the question is, and I'm not expecting an answer, the question is, over the 250 years, should mid midwives have been allowed to become history? The reason I ask this question is that in the early 1970s in New Zealand, there was a policy midwives would be replaced by what was called maternity nurses. And then the policy got reversed in early 1990s. And I believe that the cost to the health, by the way, I'm not a physician, the cost to the health service for childbirth has actually gone up by reviving midwives back into, so, I mean, there's scientific advances, then it follows uh, just as, uh, the witches in Macbeth's time <laughs> making medicines are allowed to become history. Midwives should have been allowed to become history too. Okay, interesting question. I don't know if there are any midwives here. Um, th there is no doubt that there are modern challenges now in obstetrics. And I think that the work done by David Barker, who is an epidemiologist, he worked in Southampton. David Barker recognized in the study he did in Eastern Hertfordshire, that if a child was born and the midwife looking after these pregnancies weighed not only the child, but also the placenta at birth. And if there was a disproportion between placental size and fetal size, that is what we call intrauterine growth restriction, that these individuals, when they were followed up, were more likely 50 years later to have developed hypertension, coronary vessel disease, and diabetes, and died before people who were born appropriate for dates. Now, I'm aware in New Zealand that there are anxieties about differences in longevity between ethnic groups. And I think that the challenge is that we have to go back to early pregnancy, 
when these women are carrying these children because it is probably their nutrition and supervision of fetal growth during these pregnancies that will determine what happens to the individual 50, 60, 70 years later. And it worries me that if you are pregnant, well, if, if you are a young woman, you go and see your general practitioner. Once you become pregnant, you then switch allegiance to the midwife. The midwife may be very experienced. There's a very good chance that the midwife may have trained purely in midwifery and not in general nursing. And I think there are situations where more and more of our mothers are high risk, special pregnancies. These babies really need to be studied carefully because of the outcome down the road, 50 years down the road. Secondly, and Mary and I got lost when we were coming here today, going to the neonatal intensive care unit. One of our big challenges still is that babies are born preterm. The reason that we don't always understand, sometimes there is an infectious etiology. Uh, and in London, Ronnie Lamont and others were working on trying to identify the role of anaerobic organisms, um, et cetera. I think there are still groups in our population that are at increased risk of preterm labor. It costs a great deal to look after a baby that is born 10 weeks or more preterm. And being able to identify perhaps some of the risk factors, then we could do better and perhaps, you're not gonna empty the neonatal unit because multiple pregnancies, and Professor Gillett's patients who have two or more babies will need high intensive care units. But uh, I think we need to address that challenge. Thirdly, I think there are going to be some mothers. In London, our cesarean section rate was 30 to 40%, both elective and emergency cesarean section. And it is very difficult you know, I live in Wanaka. It's very difficult when I see some of the patients there thinking, you know, if you go into labor and you need help, then it may be a while before help is received. There's to be a birthing unit opened in Albert Town. But it's a quite a long helicopter ride, let alone an ambulance ride, if you really need obstetric help. And we need to look at how we identify those high-risk mothers. You can have midwives that can do that, but I think increasingly there should be medical input to the antenatal care. I'm also aware recently an article saying that in 10 states in the US of A, they have had to close down midwifery units or birthing units because they can't get the staff to manage these. And so people are traveling long distances or even out of state to manage what may be a normal delivery or maybe that things are going wrong. So getting access to intrapartum care in the States is becoming an issue because of litigation and challenges like that. Heaven knows what's happening in the US over issues of termination of pregnancy and the consequences of some of these pregnancies being allowed to go through to term the neonatal requirements if there is a baby with abnormality. All that sort of thing means I think we need to look very carefully at high-risk situations. Other questions? There's no more questions, Alan. Please, would everyone join me in thanking Alan for a wonderful presentation. <laughs>